ServiceNow Knowledge 14 is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back. Welcome, everybody. Alan Leinwand is here. He's the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of the Cloud Platform and, and Infrastructure Components of ServiceNow. All the stuff that you don't see, it's sort of behind the curtains, all the magic and the secret sauce. Alan, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much for having me. So what's, the, uh, what's going on? What's new uh, in, the, in the Cloud Platform? You guys obviously started this before cloud was sort of even referred to yeah. as cloud, you know? Yeah, I mean. I mean, Fred talks about his vision and sort of cloud's in there, but you know, really cloud started mid-2000s, 2006, and then really started taking off um, sort of the latter, latter part of the decade. You guys kind of, maybe not predated, but sort of same time, you know? So what's, how has the platform evolved? Yeah, I mean, the platform has really evolved, I and mean, people like to talk about cloud. When they think about cloud, that's a little bit beyond water vapor. So what we end up spending, <laughs> spending our time doing is <laughs> really trying to make <laughs> silicon and make aluminum actually perform something for our customers. The cloud platform has really evolved into being a platform that allows people to develop applications that are either both for IT or for the entire enterprise. That's really what we're sort of here to talk about at, from ServiceNow's perspective in this whole show is what we've done on the platform is beyond IT and it can power services for the whole enterprise. So we've scaled our cloud significantly. We're in eight different regions across the planet, 16 different data center locations, and we're continuing to grow globally on our cloud right now. So these data center locations, you, you sort of, you're building out data centers? You're, you're, uh, we're actually you're using a wholesale and resale space, so we're uh -huh. using our data center partners, and we're building out large caves of infrastructure that we own and operate on our own. Okay, so, so just to make sure I understand. So you're not building mega data centers, yeah. right? That's not your strategy. That's right. And can you talk about why that's not your strategy? Yeah, I mean, we're not building out mega data centers like maybe they hear from Facebook and Google and right. other folks. We're actually using our data center partners to build that infrastructure to sort of meet our customer needs. We don't necessarily host people or do sort of infrastructure services like those guys do. What we end up doing is we end up building very specific cloud platform infrastructure for the enterprise. It just turns out a footprint for that just isn't as big as other folks, and we scale it as, as we need to do. And there's confusion also um, about, and I wonder if you could help us clear it up, your, your sort of, um, uh, um, your pr approach to multi-tenancy, let's sure. call it, right? So you don't have a multi-tenancy right. model. Uh, you've got more of a hybrid model. Can you talk about that a little bit and what the advantages are? Yeah, absolutely. There's folks that have a multi-tenant model, and what that really means is that multiple customers' data is interlaced and inter intersected within the same data structure, within the same database. Sounds scary. It is, it can be that <laughs> scary. What we've actually ended up doing is segmenting both the application logic into virtual machines per customer, and then actually dividing up the database itself on a per customer basis. So every one of our customers has their own unique database process, unique to them. Their own tables, their own data, their own isolation, and they have application logs that's unique to them as well. That's very different from multi-tenancy, where you have a large database and a large heap of infrastructure that a lot of people share. One of the biggest advantages for that for our customers is really about availability. If I'm a big, huge multi-tenant architecture, I need to take all hundreds and hundreds of customers in this pod and move them somewhere else because of a failure, that's a scary operation. But what we actually have the ability to do is move individual customers around our cloud and provide a very high available solution for them because of the fact and the way we've architected. So if I'm a customer and, and you're, you're on a sales call and you tell me that, I'm like, good, I want that. Right. I'm, I'm, well, I'm like totally so. cool with that. I'll sell you some, by the right? way. Now, if, okay, <laughs> now if I'm a, we're not quite big enough yet, although there's some new products that are coming out that <laughs> might, might appeal to us. Um, but now, if I'm, uh, let's say I'm an investor, I might say, well, geez, aren't I going to get better leverage if I go multi-tenancy? Think Amazon and some of right. the you know, larger players. Um, wh so, wh so what's that, your response to that? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of an interesting distinction. When people think about multi-tenancy versus single-tenancy, what we call it, what you actually find is that they think that the multi-tenancy allows you to scale the hardware better. But the truth is what we've done, what we actually call multi-instance, is the hardware can be shared, but the actual customer deployment, the Java virtual machine, the database for that customer is laid down on that shared hardware. So we're actually getting good economics of the hardware and we're giving customers the isolation they want. We think it's very unique in the industry. It allows us to do some really exciting things. Well, we heard, actually it was interesting, at Oracle Open World, which was here, I want to say two years ago. Yeah. So it was uh, 2012, well, maybe it was even 2011, it was 2011. 
Ellison really railed on multi-tenancy. Right. Yeah, he railed on Workday, he, he railed on, on, uh, on Salesforce and said multi-tenancy is a bad thing, you don't want to do it in the application. Now I think, I don't know if 12C changes that, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know if he did a flip-flop, Larry does that a lot. But, um, but, but your, 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 your dogma, if you will, yeah. is, is not going to flip-flop, right? That's I right. Mean, you guys, go, you, you can see this, am I correct? Well, let me ask you, does the scale you know, to you know, huge heights that Frank Slootman wants to hit? Yeah, I mean, we have uh, 11,000, 12,000 customer instances in the clouds, mm. individual instantiations, but let me give you a quick fact. Here for knowledge, we spun up 23,000 additional instances. So we have the ability to scale this model in a very dynamic way, in a very well orchestrated way, and we think it really helps our customers. One of the things I like to say about multi-tenancy is I get why it's good for the cloud provider, I get why the folks that build multi-tenancy build it, because you're right, it's, you build it once, you carve it up in a bunch of pieces for a customer, customer's data is interlaced, okay, I'm not so sure why I want that as a customer. A customer wants that isolation, and that's what we provide, while giving both leverage of hardware and isolation of data. Yeah, I guess, again, conceptually you can see how there might be some, some margin advantages, but then, then the big question to me is security. Sure. You know, what kind of, what kind of security um, nuance, um, nuance not the right word, does it ease the security requirements? Does it make your security cleaner, um, you know, easier well, to, to, to scale, replicate, et cetera? You talk well, about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it clearly makes our application logic easier because every portion of the application is talking to that individual database instance for that individual customer. Mm -hmm. But our security focus is really focused on protecting those instances from the various threats. So we're always looking at threats on the internet, we're always adding our perimeter firewalls, we're already doing our third party audits, we're doing our penetration tests. So just like any other cloud provider, we're continually updating our security model and making sure we're advancing and trying to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. But because we have customer data that is segmented and isolated, it, it does make our security model easier and more straightforward for the customer. Are you using a lot of open source in the back end? Or? We are. We do, okay. we do a bunch of MySQL open source for the database itself. Yeah, of course, right. We do a bunch of Apache Mon on the front end. You're using Mongo, right? We are using Mongo to help secure our document store for our larger customers, that's right. How, how, what kind of effect, if any, did Heartbleed have on you guys? Yeah, we looked at Heartbleed and we, we looked at the effect of it. We didn't really see much of an effect. We weren't using systems that were affected by that. Yeah. Awesome. So Alan, we've been covering a lot of data center stuff actually yeah. lately, and there's a lot of interesting innovation that's happening in the infrastructure sure. with cooling and power and segmentation yeah. and all kinds of interesting things. Where's the line of innovation in the data center between uh, your stuff and the infrastructure provider that you're working with? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time actually focused on the actual sort of server platform, storage platform, communication between the web servers and the network. We don't spend a lot of time on maybe hot aisle containment or cold aisle containment, worried about you know, uh, efficiency of the building or airflow through the building. We spend a lot of time sort of utilizing the best practices there. So we go look for our data center providers that are really driving that PUE number down to the 1-0 you know, level, but we're not architecting the building. We'll look for those providers and then we'll deploy our equipment in a way that takes advantage of that. You know, we're following and using some of the practices from open compute. We're looking at the next generation networking hardware and networking software that's out there. And we're really sort of leveraging everything that they're building on the, in the data center itself. And then I know there's a lot of uh, data, data regulations that are driving kind of the locations right. of your data center. So where, you said you have 16. That's right. I believe they're, they're basically in eight locations, double located that's everywhere right. if I recall. Eight countries, yeah. Yep, so uh, there's still some, uh, some, some open area that you need to penetrate based on customer demand that you haven't gone yet or where the next one's going to be? Yeah, we're going to build where the customers ask us to build. We built into Switzerland and Geneva and Zurich because of that. We built into Canada for data sovereignty issues. We're building into Brazil. We're building into Asia right now, Hong Kong and Singapore. So we're going to kind of go where the customer demand takes us. I, I had a specific question on, um, on Germany and this came up actually, we were at the uh, AWS reInvent. We did the AWS, AWS Summit and Amazon doesn't have a, a data center in, in, in Germany. Sure. You don't have a data we center do not, in Germany. We do not, that's right. Uh, but of course, everybody knows German law, everybody, everybody knows, but, but the, the, the sort of urban legend is German law says you got to store data in Germany. When we asked Amazon this, they said, well, you have a location in Ireland that's part of the EU. Um, is that a similar response that you guys that's have? That's right. We have Amsterdam and London, and we serve the EU countries through Amsterdam and, and London. And so if I'm a German customer, I would store my data there? Is yes. that right? I mean, that would be the default. I mean, we actually might have a German customer that want to be in the U.S., but we actually let our customers pick which region of the world they want to be deployed in, and we deploy on their behalf in there. So that's a prerequisite of, of, of going through the process, right? You That's choose right. where That's you're right. going to store your data. That's right. Um, and then... We let the sales guys figure that out. 
<laughs> so, I, I, so I asked, actually, and I'll ask you as well, from the Amazon perspective, has that ever been tested you know, in the court of law? Do we actually know that this stands up? Because you always hear so much from the, the anti-Amazon crowd. Oh, well, you can't choose where your data is stored. That's not true. Certainly not true with you. That's right. And Germany and Brazil, very strict. They actually have a location in Brazil. But, but so are you comfortable that it's com sort of compliant with German law in, in this instance? Do you have those conversations well, with customers? I mean, obviously you do business in Germany, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you, my last name is Austrian-German, but <laughs> I, I'm not well-versed in German law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But everything that people tell me is, you know, we can deploy That's, into... It's always a good answer <laughs> when you're not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am not a lawyer, but... But it's uh, not stopping sales, right? It's I not mean, stopping just, sales. I mean, I've, I've seen this, again, there's so much chatter and noise out there. Yeah, but, yeah but I, th I, I think it's one of those record. misperceptions. People like to throw that butt out there. They like to say, oh, you can't do business. Um, I haven't had that objection. I, I'm sure we're, we may run into it, but right now it's not top of mind. It, uh, I was going to say, what's interesting, at, at, at Percona Live, we had, actually had a lawyer on, which we don't have very often <laughs> on theCUBE, and he said, you know, there's even different data laws in Massachusetts from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, where is the data? I mean, especially in the cloud and it's distributed, you're talking about cross state borders, and you know, has that really been challenged? And it, apparently it hasn't yet, um, where it's going to get really nasty because the cloud just by its very nature, stuff's distributed. That's right. It's replicated, it's all over the place, That's so right. it's everywhere. That's right. Um, so everybody uses Germany, but he was talking about the difference between two borders, border states. Um, so it's, it could be interesting at some point in time. So we talked That's earlier right. about, um, MySQL was really was sort of the, the data platform that you started with. That's right. right. And then Mongo came in recently, didn't it? Within yeah, the last well, year or two? Or? What we ended up doing is we, we deploy the master database, or the reads and writes in MySQL. We also have capabilities in the platform that when we start to scale the hardware, we can add what's called read replicas. So we can add sort of versions of MySQL that can take transactions that are read only. And then for people that have large document stores, they're doing attachments, they're doing forms, they're doing images, things are really uh, document based, we can actually deploy Mongo and then we can use Mongo for that particular type of transaction in the system as well. So that's what you're using Mongo for? That's right. Okay, that wasn't clear to me. And, and that's it's a relatively new initiative, is it not? Yeah, it came out in Calgary, which was uh, last year was that release. Ah, uh, right, okay. I remember him talking about it last year, I think, at, at No. 13. That's right. Okay, um, so what's what's next for you guys, you know, behind the curtain? Which I, it's not really behind the curtain, but <laughs> I mean, your customers, I'm sure, <laughs> ask you say, about If I'm behind the, the curtain time, right now, that's a different story. But you story. guys, I mean, you know, it's not like you, this is a main, well, I guess it is part of your marketing, but you, you know, you're, not, you're talking about products, you're talking about value, but uh, it's great uh, that you, we have an opportunity to speak to guys like you actually, you know, running the factory, right? Yeah. So, so what's next? What's, uh, what are customers asking for? What are the innovations that you guys are working on? Yeah, I think what customers are really asking for is for us to take the cloud platform and the infrastructure and really to evolve it to be that hardened, highly available, persistent, you know, people want to talk about the cloud being like electricity, being always on. We obviously strive for that, but like any other business, we, we have issues, you know, hardware does go break, and we does go boom in the middle of the night, and we have to make sure we perfect it. We're constantly tuning that, we're focused very much on availability. You'll see something tomorrow where we're actually going to show customers their individual availability as opposed to this sort of larger distributed availability that people talk about. We're also looking into more automation, so that way things that generally break that we now have humans intervene with, we want to have that automation kick off automatically and then have people automatically do, uh, have, have the machines do that automatically instead of the humans. And we're spending a lot of time just really focused on keeping the cloud alive, keeping the cloud available, and making sure it, it is kind of behind the curtain. Yeah, right. <laughs> invisible is, is always good, right? Yep. Uh, you know, I, I asked Fred this morning, and I'll ask you, because I, I didn't fully grasp the answer, and I want to I want to keep <laughs> pressing at this, because Fred was maybe, I don't know if it was a little over my head, or it was, I don't know, maybe I just didn't <laughs> get it. But so, um, the question I had is, so you're not really like the mega data center, right? We talked That's about right. that earlier. You're not like Amazon, or Facebook, or, or Google, but you know, you're growing. That's and right. you could, you, you're getting to a scale that's quite large, and you can, you can see, you, you know, the future. You could be very, very large. Um, today, you've got, you know, n number of applications. It's not overwhelming. Uh, and the question I asked for Fred was more of a sort of architectural question. In, in database, in the database world, you, you've got transactions. You're locking on the database, the record. That's right. Uh, one, one application says, "I got it," and that's then right. releases it, and then the next one has it. As you grow out the applications, my question to Fred was, "Does that become problematic? Do you get, you know, queuing problems, performance issues, scale issues?" And he said, "His answer, if I could summarize, and I hope I get this right, was, essentially, we're not a heavy locking environment. That's number right. one, number two, there's a lot of other things that go on, that's engagements right. that go on outside of that lock. That's so." Right. Um, he didn't see it as a challenge because of the nature of the applications and, and I guess the architecture itself. But as you grow to massive scale, 
does that potentially become a problem? Um, have you architected around that? Do you have to architect around that or am I just not understanding it? Yeah, I mean, I think if we were multi-tenant where we had thousands of customers sharing a single database, dealing with those locking issues and the semaphore issues, we'd have that issue. Mm. But fortunately, because every customer gets their own version of their own unique database, they're just worried about the applications that they're running. So what we end up doing is we end up monitoring the hardware and monitoring the databases for transaction rates per customer. And as those transaction rates per customer, as they add applications, as they add users, as they're adding joins and lists and building forms and creating services like Fred talked about this morning, we can actually find out if their database is starting to see issues. And if their particular database is starting to see issues, we can then go deploy read replicas, we can go deploy things like Mongo on a customer by customer basis. So we don't have this scale issue per se, we have the monitor the individual customer transaction rate issue and make sure we're always automating and always upgrading the infrastructure to match. Yeah, okay, so you've obviously thought about this problem and the customer has to be quite large That's to right. even encounter the problem. That's right. And then you've got methods, techniques, approaches, uh, even, I don't even call it brute force approaches. We can, we can uh, solve it with more silicon. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, right. there, are, there are cases yeah. where the bigger box wins, right? Yeah. Moore's Law wins, you can, you can add more metal to the cloud, so, and you can make it bigger. So the point of all, the reason I'm asking all these questions is not just for sort of you know, academic or theoretical. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious as to, is this a potential constraint to your growth down the road, and I'm, I'm hearing no, it's not. Yeah, we don't see it as a constraint. Some of our biggest customers are running very, very large transaction rates. We're able to scale both the core metal to actually drive those transactions, as well as tune the system and tune the way the database behaves. So that way those interactions you're talking about, those locks, those joins, those select statements, can actually be handled by the system in a very efficient manner. And what do you make of all this, you know, it sort of started at, uh, at VMworld a year or so ago with the whole software-defined meme and the acquisition of NICERA, software-defined networking, now they're talking about software-defined storage. Um, you certainly see that from the hyperscale guys. That's right. um, what do you make of that? Is that, is that uh, how does that affect your world? Well, you're, you're talking to a guy that actually worked on a software-defined networking company. I founded a company called Viata in my past, oh, okay. which Brocade actually bought. Right. So I believe in the software-defined networking. I believe that software and algorithms running the metal makes a lot of sense. Our automation, our workflow, our orchestration tools we have on the platform are what we use to bend our metal in the way we like for our customers. And I think really putting logic into the software and letting the software actually change the infrastructure is the way for the future. And, and so, Thinking about your storage and your network uh, and your your compute infrastructure, yeah. you're sort of buying off the shelf, obviously, That's right? right? Um, standard servers, are you buying from ODMs or a combination? Or? We, do, we do a little both. We actually look at our servers on an annual basis. We evaluate both ODMs that are in white boxes as well as your typical OEMs. And then we're looking to understand the transaction rates and the performance of those particular pieces of hardware. We do a price performance evaluation and we sort of upgrade and continue to migrate the farm forward. And how about the storage? I mean, you're buying big giant container no, boxes, big we're sands, not. We're not. so it's commodity storage. It's commodity storage, horizontally yeah. scaled across the servers. We don't believe in centralized storage model, no fiber channel, no InfiniBand. No fiber channel, no, and your stack is your stack? Our you, stack you, is our you, stack. So you've That's written right. your own stack to do replication and data migration and Replica snapshots. And the replication side is actually using MySQL bin line replication. Yep, okay. The backup itself is actually using some open source tools as well as some technologies we've stuck on top of it. We actually call it SN Vault for ServiceNow Vault. And we've actually developed both a hybrid of open source and our own technologies to make that work. Do you use tape? We do not use tape. No tape. No Zero tape. tape. Yeah, I think Frank would I'm let so me. I'm not surprised, <laughs> given that Frank Slootman's <laughs> exactly. running the company. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the networking? <clears throat> What's the strategy there? Yeah, from the networking point of view, we use commodity gear as well from you know the big two vendors out there, Cisco and Juniper. Uh -huh. We're continually looking to upgrade. We're continually looking to drive layer three technologies down close to the user and have a very reliable, very redundant system. Let me give you an example. In every data center cage location, we have at least three tier one providers. We have a fully redundant network all the way from the internet, through the firewalls, through the load balancers, all the way down to the servers in the rack. And we just believe in high availability, enterprise grade, top to bottom. And, uh, and what about this notion of converged infrastructure? You're seeing that a lot. Is that something that you're, you're looking at, you're staying away from, you're adopting? Or? We actually think it makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm not going to tell you we're doing it right now because it's, it's pretty bleeding edge and we want to be highly available for the enterprise. But this idea of a converged network and systems infrastructure that works together with automation, again, it's just part of our platform, part of our DNA. 
So kind of you know, single throat to choke and yeah. you know, reduce pass man, pat, patch management, just a block of infrastructure. That, that's sensible to you. It, absolutely, yeah. I mean, from our point of view, the ServiceNow cloud platform would be that orchestration and automation this platform. This is like field day for me, being able yeah. to ask all these <laughs> questions of a, of a practitioner that's, that's actually building out a big, and I'm a big cloud. You know? <laughs> no, it sounds awesome. And uh, okay, well, uh, let's see. So we, we hit on SDN, we <laughs> hit on all the pieces here, I guess. Uh, I think I'm out, I think, uh, I think I'm, uh, you can good. tap out anytime you want. Yeah, that's fantastic. I really appreciate the insights. You know, because you know, you know, a lot of the a lot of the cloud suppliers don't like to talk about, you know, the internal plumbing. But I think it's important. You know, well, your customers want to know. And I mean, at the end of the day, you don't build a great, you know, multi-billion-dollar business without understanding how infrastructure works and the architecture of the infrastructure. I'm a really strong believer that our applications are driving the enterprise forward, and I would have a hard time talking to the CIOs I talk to on a regular basis without convincing them that the infrastructure they are relying on for those applications is as solid as it gets. Do you see the need, I do have another one, so do you see the need, you know, <laughs> remember the early days, we all, at least I all, thought, okay, here's, here comes you know, guys like Amazon, it's commodity infrastructure, software led, that's going to bleed into the enterprise, you're starting to see that happen now, but, now Amazon's kind of done a 180. That's right. They're going highly customized That's infrastructure. Right. Right. They won't show us their servers, but they'll show us, uh, you know, uh, uh, some ODM server that's super dense, and they say we blow that away, right. and because they control their data centers. Do you see that type of customization requirement for your servers and for your for your, for your networking? Yeah, we spend time looking at that as well. I won't say perhaps we do it quite in depth as Amazon because we mm -hmm. don't run quite the same size department they do. But we do look at you know the motherboards and the PCI cards and the the, uh, the flash disk that's in there, the SSD. We spend time understanding the BIOS. We spend time understanding how many ports we're going to connect to the top rack switch. We spend time specking all that. I mean, we're we're a full hardened enterprise platform, and you know our customers depend on us to do that. So we have to we have to do that diligence. Are you using flash? All right, we still got time. Are you using flash? We are. How, how are you using it? Yeah, we are using flash. We find that the flash arrays uh, we use Fusion IO. And for those SSD cards, we put them into our higher end database servers. We're moving actually off spinning media onto Flash for the entire farm. And one of the way we use it is it helps us get IOPS out of the database servers, and it actually helps in replication, because the way replication works is I'm operating in data center A, I do my transaction in that database, I write it out to the Flash, because the database is in memory, I send it over the Parasite, the Parasite's got to read it off disk and rerun that transaction and keep that replication in sync. So that I.O. actually does help us keep replication going. So are you using Percona MySQL or, or no? No. Oh, okay, so do you? We're using our own MySQL. Okay, uh, do you do atomic writes uh, with Fusion? Or? Uh, we are doing some writes with Fusion, yes. Yeah, okay, so you're, you're essentially bypassing the SCSI stack and writing directly to? We have the ability to do that with the new Fusion I.O. drivers. So I'm not sure they're widely deployed right now. But does now. it have potential? It absolutely yeah, has I mean, that's potential. Like, yeah, that's an amazing performance. You can go right? straight from memory, straight to SSD, just like you're actioning a RAM chip. Why wouldn't we want to so do that? So not only am I eliminating the spinning disk, I'm, I'm eliminating the overhead of uh, the, 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 the storage protocol. We'd love to be able to do that, yes. Oh, uh, okay. That's, uh, and that's you're extending the life of the Flash, per David Floyer's article that we uh, covered the other day, because right. it's yeah. written specifically for Flash as opposed to written for disk onto Flash. How about object store? Is that something that you're... you're you know, we generally don't have a ton of object stores that we do, but when we do, they're document types, they're attachments to an incident, they're graphics on a particular application, they're part of a workflow that pops up or presents something to the customer. And if those sort of uh, documents become heavy transactional types for reads in the database, we'll put those on Mongo. Okay, so, and, and you're doing sort of a combination of block and file, or? Uh, it's, all, it's all block. It's all block? Yeah. All block? Yeah. Okay. Well, file, I Except guess, for, Mongo. I guess, what you're doing in Mongo, That's of right. course, file or, right. or quasi-object. Right? That's right. Awesome. I'm having a field day here. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really appreciate all the insights, you know. It's, uh, this is good. I'm going to actually go and back and, and watch this several times. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the truth is, for us, it, it's all about, like I said, it's all about talking to folks about infrastructure. We think the infrastructure is the core foundation for everything mm. we do in the enterprise apps. The apps are really what our customers are about, letting them be creators and letting them use our applications. But let's face it, you know, we build the cloud and the cloud's got to be solid to run those apps. All right, my last question. So you, we've been talking about all these cool innovations. When do you see these, or do you see these seeping into the, the enterprise on premise? Do you see that as a sort of viable approach for CIOs? Or, or in your view, are they just going to sort of outsource it mostly to the cloud over the next decade? Um, pretty clearly biased at the moment, but you know, I don't Well, know. but you're application driven. We're talking about Fair infrastructure enough. Fair know, enough. from the side. Right? I mean, I think the things that we're doing in the cloud and the infrastructure are sort of leading edge. I do think the enterprises are going to adopt that. But I'll be honest with you, there are certain enterprises that are ahead of us, right? 
there's certain folks that are thinking one or two steps ahead of us because they're at just a bigger scale than we are. Not most, though. Yeah, not most, yeah. but there are some, and yeah. we learn from them. Yeah, we big learn banks from those, and yeah, yeah, I'm thinking the big banks, yeah. the big, big uh, financial institutions. Yeah. We spend time with them, learning what they're doing inside, so we can actually make the cloud better. And they're sharing with you, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, because they're trying to learn too, right? Yeah. They're really they don't want to outsource to somebody that's running on bailing wire. Right. They don't yeah. want to outsource Amazing to innovations actually going on in financial services. You know, it's like the uh, the downturn never happened. But, uh, <laughs> Alan, thanks very much. Thanks really for appreciate your time. the insight. Appreciate it. All right, great stuff. Keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Frick and I will be right back. We're live from Knowledge 14. This is the Cube.